Buongiorno, allora, and thank you very much for joining us today as well with this wonderful weather, finally a little bit cold, but, and to be honest, yesterday was a great, great day, I think we can share all together this impression of a very rich day with new proposal for new aspects on the study of Leonardo Sciascia, but on, not only the study of literature in general and the understanding as literature is obviously uh, the representation of reality and how we need now more than ever as every I think generation repeated since long time. But this is our generation, our time and so it is great to be part of it in the, in the meaning of the studying has unveiled things that everyday life actually is imposing us in a hard time as we are living. Uh, yesterday we, <coughs> thanks to the saluti uh, at the beginning of the institution, so Senator Bonino, Under Secretary De La Vedova, and then Mariangela Zappia, so the Italian ambassador, and obviously our host uh, Fabio Finotti, so the director of the Italian Cultural Institute here in New York, we had a sense of how politics and literature can understand each other in a way, even if sometimes they need to fight to understand this, <laughs> the right way to go. And, uh, and then we touched the myth of America, the myth of the Mediterranean, and then the adaptation, translation, how to understand not only the, transla the linguistical translation, but how from Phaedrus, for Aesopus, for example, Le Favole, Le Favole della Dittatura can be not just translated, but just be part of the tradition of poetical prose since ancient Greek to today. And then we watched a wonderful clip of a, a unreleased, and uh, it was unreleased until yesterday, <laughs> interview to Leonardo Sciascia and Fellini made by Rita Cirio in 1983, that I think was <coughs> the top of the day in a way because was the rule of the writer and the rule of the movies. So the adaptation of words and images. And then we had uh, a, a session on cinema that was important to underline how many uh, movies were made from Leonardo Sciascia's works. And then finally we have the last session of the America of Leonardo Sciascia in which myself and, and Walter Vecellio tried to explore a little bit more the impression of and love and rejection of this country from Europe at the time and the brotherhood with intellectual that Shasha created with the American intellectuals. Today I'm extremely happy because it's a very fresh in a way and young uh, sessions, but especially because I think we need not just to find new things, because that's so boring to find, to look for new things, what does it mean to be new, but to change approach to things. In fact, the speakers today, so Alessandro Giamme, Giulia Pellizzato, Salvatore Pappalardo, <coughs> and myself, I'm not a speaker, but we are Italians that decided to live in the United States. So we left the great country of Italy, in the sense, in which culture is the main thing, but we are now since a long time, exploring a new way to approach Italian literature, Italian culture in general. And so that means not stopping at Italian culture, but understanding how Italian means a mixture of cultures that together participate to create the marvelous and refined art of the Western. So I think this will be a very good session, sessions. And so let's start with Leonardo Sciascia in, Amer in America, so the American reception of a Sicilian writer. And first speaker today is Alessandro Giammei from Yale University. As assistant professor, he works at the crossway of textual and visual studies, focusing on European modernity and its uh, fantasies of genealogical roots in Renaissance and classical cultures. As you can see, his biography is exactly what I was trying to introduce. Uh, he specializes in Mediterranean surrealism and magical realism, the boundaries of legibility and, trans and translability, the codes of masculinity, chivalry, and epic storytelling, experimental poetry, and its report with painting, an object that queer 
uh, what we call textuality, humanism, authenticity and Italian identity. Alessandro is currently working on a book about Leonardo Ariosto, sì, Ludovico, oh, Leonardo Ariosto, ok, makes sense, <laughs> that, that was kind of nice, Leo, Ludovico, you have to think about it, because since your approach is so fresh, it's so new, probably, you should do that, so, but, see now, is still working on Ludovico Ariosto, and re, revivals of the Renaissance in the 20th century Italy. A shorter monograph about Shakespeare's ghost in the philology and spiritism of fascist Italy. And a trade book in Italian about things that are traditionally or surprisingly read as masculine. In addition to scholarly essays in English and in Italian, he regularly writes for newspaper and literary magazines such as The New Domani, Il Manifesto, that we well know, Flash Art, and Nuovi Argumenti. Thank you, <coughs> Alessandro, for accepting our <coughs> invitation. Please, thank you. Thank you so much, Valerio. Okay, good morning. Ecco qua. Leonardo Ariosto is excellent. Also Ludovico Sciascia would be excellent as well. So like most Italians of my generation, I have read Leonardo Sciascia for the first time in high school. Not as part of Italy's rather dusty national curriculum, which spends incomparably more time on medieval and early modern poetry rather than on modern and contemporary fiction. I read Shasha, we read Shasha, I would say, as, a, as teenage students during the long summer breaks between the school years, along with those late 20th century writers such as Calvino, Pavese, Ginzburg, or Morante, that teachers typically used to assign, as we say, per le vacanze. To be sure, in the early 2000s, Shasha was certainly already included in the historical anthology of most textbooks, but nobody was actually able to cover the post-war years in time for the final national exam, l'esame di maturità. This meant, however, that while we got to know more chronologically remote authors only through mere excerpts of their works, along with their biographies and reconstructions of their historical contexts, Shasha was one of those that came to us in the form of entire, complete, self-sufficient books. I believe that the myth of Leonardo Sciascia in Italy, as a public intellectual able to write compelling literature more writerly than Pasolini and more clearly openly politically engaged than Calvino for my generation, is really rooted in the fact that people like me, people like us, had the opportunity to read him per le vacanze, at the same time for school and outside of scholastic rituals and textbooks. I would like to thank Professor Finotti, Professor Cappozzo, and the Amici di Leonardo Sciascia for this opportunity to immerse myself again, after almost two decades, in that very first experience of scholarly reading with no safety net for le vacanze. Returning to Sciascia's novels, and in particular to Il Giorno della Civetta in Todo Modo, which are my favorite, uh, I realized that so many specific references to Italy's recent history and postmodern culture were completely lost on me as an adolescent reader. And that Shasha's erudition, his direct dialogue with an incredible archive of European auctoritates in the fields of philosophy, literature, and art, went over my head as a high schooler. To me, Shasha was a master of delightful description and frustrating enigmatic plots able to give me the impression that there was a political, aesthetic, and philo philosophical genealogy at the root of the beautiful and deeply unjust nation in which I was growing up. No more than an impression, though. And now that I have the tools to turn that impression into consciousness and even scholarship, I feel the need to resist the impulse. I find myself less curious about demystifying my own myth of Shasha through the substance of his references and ciphers, and more curious about other radically different experiences of that same myth. In other words, 
I am curious about what in Italian we call La Fortuna di Sciascia, where an author like him was probably never assigned as a summer break reading, and where he could not provide a sentiment of the nation suspended between literature and politics. That is why this morning I'm going to talk about Sciascia's American myth, and in particular I will offer a glimpse into his Italian-American myth. As I imagine most people in this room already know, Shasha is a protagonist of virtually any book in English about, um, about the cultural dimension of the so-called Italian-American experience. Mostly, he is quoted on the topic of a Sicilianness, Sicilianità, on which he so eloquently wrote, mixing a vibrantly sentimental poetics of the genius Lodge with very solid scholarly readings that span from medieval Arabic poetry, as we know, to Verga and Pirandello. Sicilian American authors and scholars at the intersection of Italian and ethnic studies tend to refer to Shasha more often than to other renowned literary masters from the island, such as Pirandello. And they often mention his work, including his novels, not as a primary source, but rather as an archive of quasi-anthropological statements on Italianness and Sicilianness as transnational and transhistorical conditions. The occasion for today's talk comes from a famous American book of Italian-American studies, a scholarly book that has had a significant popular appear, appeal and that resorts to Shasha's authority in an interesting way. It is titled La Storia, Five Centuries of the Italian-American Experience, and it was published exactly three decades ago, so three years after Shasha's death. It represents the magnum opus of two Italian-American novelists and scholars, Giare Mangione, who taught literature at the University of Pennsylvania, and Ben Morreale, a professor of history at SUNY Plattsburgh. In the over 500 pages of their gripping history of the Italian-American experience, Mangione and Morreale mention Shasha only a dozen times, more or less as much as they mention Pirandello or Verga. However, they often do so to correct or reframe something that Pirandello, Verga, and other Italian writers said about Sicily. In particular, they use Shasha to point out that uh, other Sicilian authors tended to minimize, omit, or depict without realism, as they say, the various waves of mass immigration that brought the island's diaspora north and west, and in particular in the United States, of course. While both of them, in their novels, openly imitated and quoted from Elio Vittorini's and Luigi Pirandello's works, for instance, Shasha was clearly a different kind of auctoritas for them, at the same time more personal and sort of oracular. The most obvious reason for this is their proximity with Shasha. They both knew him personally, promoted the translations of his work in America, and were, in fact, reviewed by Shasha in Italian newspapers. While, with the help of the excellent archives that the two authors left behind, I am working on Shasha Smith in both Mangiones and Morreale's work, for reasons of time and interest, this morning I'm going to focus on the latter and Ben Morreale. I believe that Ben Morreale's reception of Leonardo Shasha Smith is particularly revealing and intriguing because besides interviewing, quoting, and studying him as a scholar and a writer, Morreale incorporated Shasha as a character in one of his novels, turning him into a literary figure with a special function in his Italian-American fiction. I should start by saying that Morreale's family migrated to the United States, and specifically to Brooklyn, from the town of Racalmuto. Moreover, when he was a young boy, Morreale actually spent a couple of rather formative years in Racalmuto under the tutelage of his grandmother. At the age of 12, he returned to Racalmuto for a slightly longer period. And there, as he recalls in his memoir, Sicily, A Hollowed Land, he was a gymnasiale, so a freshman, in the same high school where Shasha was a liceale, a junior. He had a chance 
to observe fascist parades and rituals, social dynamics, and family histories exactly in Shasha's own milieu, the one that would produce, for instance, Le Parrocchie di Regal Petra. Right before he moved to Caltanissetta with his family, I believe, Shasha moved to Caltanissetta and Morreale went back to the United States. He had the chance, perhaps more importantly for what I'm interested in, to observe Shasha himself. The two eventually became correspondents and friends, and Morreale interviewed Shasha on many occasions. As Shasha was making a name for himself with literary works such as Le Parrocchie and Gli Zid America, Morreale published his first novel, The Seventh Saracen, the strongly autobiographical story of an Italian-American guy, significantly named Guy, a symbolic Americanization of Gaetano, who returns to a fictionalized Racalmuto called Racalmorra and struggles with his identity. Reading it with the help of an English friend, con l'aiuto di un'amica inglese, as he wrote in an article for the newspaper Lora in 1966, Shasha underlined the ethnic dimension of this novel, something that was not obvious in 1966 Italy. A preoccupation of the Italian-American experience that would have appeared completely alien to a peninsular reader. And he even translated one of the most striking dialogues of the book to publish it, along with his article, in which the protagonist claims an ancestry from Normandy to an unimpressed Sicilian woman in order to establish a difference between him, the American, and uh, the Sicilians that uh, he believed did not look like him in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity. In 1973, established both as a scholar and a writer, Morreale wrote his most ambitious novel titled A Few Virtuous Men, with a rather interesting subtitle in uh, Sicilian, Li Cornuti. This was his most successful work of fiction and the only one that appeared in an Italian translation, not with the title Li Cornuti, but with the title Uomini d'Onore. As this formula suggests, it is a novel that investigates through the point of view of a local priest named Jufa, for obvious reasons that we know from yesterday, the phenomenon of the mafia, on which of course Shasha at that point was one of the most credible and refined literary authorities and political authorities. However, as I mentioned before, in this novel, Shasha is not used as an autoritas to be quoted or imitated, but rather as a fictional character that is integral, integral to the story. Fred Gardaffe and Chiara Mazzucchelli, among others, have underlined the special brand of realism and claim of authenticity that Morreale placed at the root of a few virtuous men, Li Cornuti. In a moment in which American audiences were captivated by highly visible aestheticizations and even fetishizations of the mafia, of its affects, and of its performances of masculinity in particular, Morreale stripped the aura of the American gaze from this theme and from this uh, topic. It was Shasha, after all, who noticed how the aesthetics of the gangster had more to do with the return of a repressed archetype of the American crooked politician, he talks about Nixon, rather than with the representation of actual wise men of Italian descent. Morreale's uomini d'onore are slender, soberly dressed, and characterized by what a Renaissance humanist would have called sprezzatura. They minimize their power, their influence, and the effort that they're willing to make to keep the community in check. We receive these realistic figures as readers, mostly from the point of view of a local priest, as I was saying, who harbors pro-fascist sentiments and is ambivalent towards the main uomo d'onore, whose name is Don Raffaele Petrocelli. A sort of descendant uh, of Manzoni's Don Abbondio, this protagonist of Morreale's novel offers us an, an ironic perspective to understand from a non-peninsular point of view and a non-Italian point of view the effect 
that competing forces of power and control had even on the educated citizens of Italy and of Sicily in particular as a liminal space. However, the priest is therefore inadequate to express the author's more sophisticated take on the society and culture that he observed firsthand in his adolescence and studied, uh, studied as a historian. And that is why Shasha Smith assumes a crucial literary function in A Few Virtuous Men. The most charming character of the novel is Nardu Pantaleone, a local historian and writer who escapes the horrors of fascism through literature. Nardo is, of course, a nickname for Leonardo, not Leonardo Ariosto, but Leonardo Sciascia, one that Ben Morreale in his memoir attributed directly to Sciascia, stating that everybody in Racalmuto called the Sciascia Nardo. And that Pantaleone is a romanticized version of Shasha is made evident by many details, including his predilection for Dostoevsky, Voltaire, and Poe, his relationship with winemaking, and his erudition about the Mediterranean ancestry of Sicilian language and literature. Nardo is a crucial figure in the economy of Morreale's novel because his wisdom, completely antithetical to that of the wise man that he fully understands and despises, is the key through which readers can overcome the mystique of the mafia culture. Both the extra-diegetic mystique in their horizon of expectation and the intra-diegetic one built by Don Petrocelli's performance and perception in Raquel Morra. I'm going to conclude my talk on just one example of how this fictional version of Leonardo Sciascia provides depth to Morreale's narration, allowing him to address an Anglophone audience with philological acumen. In one of the most pedagogical passages of the book, Morreale explains that Don Petrocelli's approach to reality is based on one particular world, one that synthesizes the entire normative structure of the mafia culture, the word sistemato that he uses in English also in the American edition. Morreale does so through the intradiegetic authority of Shasha. On winter nights, he writes, Nardu, as everyone called Pantaleone, would talk about the genius of the Sicilian language, its obscenities against the Virgin, and the words sistemato and cornuto, end quote. Immediately after, in a rather Sicilian use of indirect discourse, he explains that the word sistemato is close to the genius is closer to the genius of the Sicilian language than the word omerta. I quote again, as some would have you believe the word omerta might be, the word sistemato is closer to the genius of the Sicilian language. He explains that in Sicilian mentality, one is sistemato when one is well off, integrated, put together. And that when someone like Don Petrocelli states that a man must be sistemato, he meant that the man should be put in his place and even eliminated if he resists his natural niche in this world. To quote again from the text, it was often asked of a man who returned from America, how are you sistemato? What is your relation to the whole? What is your place? To say of a man that he was malo sistemato might mean that he was uneasy in this world. Don Raffaele Petrocelli believed more than anything else in the world that things and men had to be sistemati in their place, that the forces in the world, the sinews and nerves of men that kept them in their places, held them together really were property and women." End of quote. At the beginning of this whole explanation of the philosophy of Sistemato, the character of Nardo Pantaleone connects this world to its Greek origin, its supposed Greek origin, stating that it originally used to refer to togetherness, to interrelatedness, to a system of relationships. I believe that through his fictional version of Shasha, Morreale established a subtle connection between the Sicilian paradigm of Sistema with its Mediterranean Greek origin horridly evolved into a hyper-masculine mafia mindset in the Italian paradigm of the 
fascio, which instead has a Latin Roman origin in the fable about Concordia that Aesop wrote, that generated the symbol of the fascio, littorio, which also alludes to togetherness, relatedness, and unbreakable relations. Considering what is almost certainly about to happen this very weekend with the Italian elections, this 50-year-old subtle link between fascism, mafia, and the oppressive mentality of sistema and sistemato assumes a sinister and timely aura. It is through a rather unique literary use of Leonardo Shasha Smith that Ben Morreale was able to establish it, making the Italian-American gaze on Italy's culture more revealing than an internal and supposedly indigenous perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And starting yesterday, talking about the myth and the um, reception of the author. Now the transformation is done. Now he's a, a literary character. So that's why I, I start this session saying there is something new and something really in depth that is changing the perspective of the studies. Because when a, a writer becomes a, a, a character himself, there is really a transformation, a relationship between human beings that's really strong and that has to be investigated as you are doing. So thank you very much. Now it's time for Giulia Pellizzato and so it's time for Leonardo Sciascia as someone that has been published in the United States. So we have the character and now we have the author. As you can see, as I said before, Italian studies can really explore different kinds of of uh, aspects of a writer. So Giulia Pellizzato is at Harvard University and is working on the project Transatlantic Transfer, the Italian Presence in Post-War America, founded by the Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research. Before coming to Harvard, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Italian department at Brown University, thanks to the postdoctoral grant founded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, because you got your PhD at uh, l'Università Italiana della Svizzera. <laughs> okay, oggi è così. Okay, the Switzerland University of Italy. Her research interests include 20th and 19th century Italian literature, the transatlantic circulation of literary works and ideas, translation studies, and the pedagogy of literature. Her, um, her published research includes studies on translation practices, women in publishing, archives of the 20th century, and authors including Goffredo Parise, Giuseppe Prezzolini, Yolanda Insana, Ippolito Nievo. Her first book, Prezzolini e Parise, Una Amicizia Transoceanica, is just been published a year ago actually by Leo Olsky, and it's a really nice and fine book. So welcome, Julia, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valerio. Thanks to everyone here. Um, so I need to set up a little bit. She has a PowerPoint. I do. I know. But I can do that. Really? Slide. Ah, no, here, sorry. Sorry, we are just creating a suspense. Actually, it's made for you. this policy of basta carta, so I'm <laughs> for this new year I vowed not to print. <laughs> and
And so, um, again, many thanks to Valerio Capozzo, to the Associazione Amici di Leonardo Sciascia, to the Istituto Italiano di Cultura that is hosting us, and to the Committee for the Centennial of Leonardo Sciascia's birth for their generous hospitality and for creating this occasion for scholarly as well as passionate exchange among readers of Leonardo Sciascia. And also thanks to my brilliant colleague, uh, Alessandro Giammai, for opening this panel in such a compelling way. So uh, from my part, I would like to focus on the reception of Leonardo Sciascia's works during the earlier decades. So if we think of when the first book by Sciascia translated in the US was issued, and today the first half, basically. Uh, um, because I think it illustrates the tensions, the changes, and the mythologies that are involved in the creation of Leonardo Sciascia's image in the United States. Um, so today, Sciascia is considered uh, one of Sicily's most celebrated public intellectuals, and I'm quoting here from Jun Palahiri's preface to Sciascia's story in the most recent collection of Penguin Italian short stories. And yesterday we heard that um, probably we'll have a new wave of Shasha's translation soon. <laughs> but for the moment, I quote from the last wave of Shasha's editions in the US, uh, the New York Review of Books reprints that date to the early 2000 years. Just to understand who is Shasha for them. So, um, William Simone Di Piero, who is uh, another US-based writer and translator, introduces Shasha to new US-American readers of To Each His Own in this way. He says that Shasha used storytelling as an instrument for investigating and attacking the ethos of a culture which he believed to be a metaphor of the world. And according to Di Piero, Shasha's major novels are about political morality, though they are not political in content or moralizing in intent. Each is a genre piece, a detective story, but of an odd kind. When all clues are gathered and aligned, they lead to a wrong solution, or the mystery proves insoluble, because practically everyone involved except the investigator is duplicitous. Can you hear me? No. Okay. So we heard it time and again yesterday, and we find it here as well. So Shasha's game with the reader's expectations, the odd nature of his detective stories, are clarified up front by Di Piero. And this is because the tensions between the reader's expectations, or we could call them their horizon, call it the, their horizon of expectations, if we want to use Hans Robert Jauss's terminology. Uh, so the tension between these horizons of expectations and the ways in which Shasha plays with the features and cliches of the giallo uh, genre, sorry, that characterizes the decades I'll be talking about today. Uh, I think James Marcus encapsulated these tensions yesterday by saying that Shasha did not fit into the categories of US American mass readership. And in the context of our US-based research group working on the reception of Leonardo Shasha in the US, I investigated the transatlantic networks and mediators who brought Leonardo Shasha's books to US American readers. So I carried out a first portion of my work studying the archival holding at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas, uh, which hosts the archival papers of Knopf, Shasha's first publisher in the United States. Um, this first part, which I presented in December 2021 at our virtual session hosted by the Istituto Italiano di Cultura in San Francisco, uh, has to do with what preceded the publication of books like Mafia Vendetta, The Council of Egypt, and Equal Danger. I'll tell a bit more about this in a minute. And for this presentation, which I half jokingly titled Becoming a Leading Writer, in one way or another, the reception of Leonardo Sciascia within uh, the US, uh, I want to focus on what accompanied and followed the publication of Sciascia's books in the Anglosphere, particularly in the US. 
So this time my work includes uh, hundreds of texts from digitized newspapers and journal databases uh, with book reviews, advertisement, paratexts of various kinds, uh, lifestyle journal art articles with some form of distant reading with which I'm experimenting. Uh, so, to well-versed experts of Leonardo Schach, like you all are, some of these texts uh, would probably look plain, sometimes maybe dull, and in some cases even unspeakable, if I may borrow a key term from our presentation for this colloquium. But as a matter of course, many of these texts are a bit flat in comparison to Shasha's compelling writing, of course. Um, but this is part and parcel of the investigations I wish to involve you in today, looking carefully at what's hiding in plain sight. Uh, many of us shared our personal connection to Shasha during this colloquium. Um, I also wanted to share that during the past few years, what led my research was an exploration of how people understand literature, the uses they make of it, and the meanings they attach to it. Uh, the translations panel's verdict yesterday, that in general it's better to translate dead authors, shows something that can be forgotten sometimes. Um, despite copyright laws, we could say that texts belong to those who read it. So this has implications and consequences on the methodologies we use to study literary texts. I quote uh, just one example. As an Italianist, I was trained uh, to study above all and have as a point of reference first editions. But during my postdoctoral research on the transmission, translation and reception of Italian literature in the US, I had to recognize that first editions had a limited circulation if compared to reprints and paperbacks of Italian translated fiction. So the metamorphosis generated by translation and reception in a new cultural system, such as Italian literature in the US, offer exquisite opportunities for examining the negotiations of meanings and the understandings and the compelling misunderstandings fostered by translation. And I would propose to shift from misunderstanding to creation of meaning, actually. Uh, so, for our investigation of today, I was inspired by the plot as well as the early US American reception of, in one way or another, todo modo. The mystery, uh, or the murder, is this one. How could a book that we consider an emblem of Shasha and his description of, I'm quoting Farrell here, the quasi-criminal conspiracies between finance, police, and politics that masquerade as democracy. So how can a book such important be received as, and I quote, a little bit more than bits of warmed over Karamazov, slipping into an abyss of banality, a tiresome story